Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, again, in collaboration with my brother in Christ from the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, we are coming here together to do another session of understanding the truth of Daniel's 70 weeks and to prove to you, without any doubt, that not only Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel's 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27, perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago but also that the whole of the New Testament is testimony to Jesus Christ exactly doing that, and that anyone who teaches something else is t teaching that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, and in short, very biblical words, that is the teaching of the spirit of Antichrist. So, we have done a lot of work in this little paper that I have prepared. Last time we finished reading in Acts chapter 7, we went into telling you that after the stoning of Stephen, the 70th week of Daniel was completely fulfilled and the gospel went to the Gentiles. And this is where we leave Tom Fress in and welcome my brother in Christ warmly to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. Hope all is well. Hello. Hello, Yerk, and everything's fine. Little laryngitis again, but I'll struggle through it. Nice to be here. It's my blessing, privilege, and uh, and uh, very, very glad and thankful to be here. Thanks. It would be news if you told us that the laryngitis is gone. <laughs> otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, I think we say as long as you have it, yeah. it's all right. We know it. <laughs> it's a crazy thing that you cannot get off that chronic disease, yeah. more or less. It's, it's, it's a know. shame. Yeah. It's a shame. But we hear you. We hear you loud and clear, Tom, and that is very necessary. It is necessary that your voice and uh, voices like mine are heard loud and clear in this world because we are, as Michael de Semlian uh, said in his book, All Roads Lead to Rome, watchmen on the wall. The watchmen that are there to warn the others about the complete and utter fulfillment of mm -hmm. Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27. Mm -hmm. This is, without any exaggeration, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, Eden that futurism is told, that speaks of a future 70 weeks mm. of Daniel. Yeah. And we go here in the, in, the, in the paper, as you can see, we see once again Daniel 70th week lasted from 27 AD to 34 AD, that is exactly seven years. 
and the whole 70 weeks started in 457 BC and then ended in 34 AD, which is completely 490 years. There was no second pause, not, not, second with, I mean, not a second, yeah, the time frame of a second. There was not a second pause between the first seven weeks and the following 70, uh, 62 weeks. And there was never a quote unquote second in time frame seen again, pause between the end of the 69th and the beginning of the 70th week. Yeah, they so, were 490 consecutive years. There consecutive was no break years, yeah. in between the seventh uh, week and uh, the, the eighth week, and there was no, no break, no gap, no space between the 69th and the 70th week. It's, uh, you know, the days are consecutive. And uh, you, can't, you can't believe the historical record as long as all the pastors are telling you that there's a 2,000-year gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. It's an absolute lie. It's the most childish load of hooey that ever came down the Protestant and evangelical pipe, and it's a Jesuit creation. It was intended to disrupt, to, to absolutely emasculate the Protestant Reformation. And it has. The Jesuits... <laughs> I hate to say this, my critics are going to just explode with uh, suspicion, but you've got to admire someone as genius as the Jesuits to coming up with the, with with a lie so fancy that it was that it was believed by the vast majority, the lion's share of Protestants and evangelicals in our generation. And it's just a marvel to me that anybody believed it, including myself. And um, uh, it's uh, it's just I want I want people to realize how much we've been deceived. Now look, I want to emphasize a point that you made. Not only is the seventieth week of Daniel over, not only did Jesus fulfill that seventieth and final week of Daniel's prophecy perfectly and completely, but the New Testament is the black and white written historical record of every detail of that 70th and final week. And you can just literally, as we have done right here on the air for everybody to listen to and to see, we have literally read the key uh, 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 scriptural evidences that show the perfect and complete fulfillment of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And there will be many, and, many uh, verses more, Tom, that we will throw oh, yeah. into for proving. Uh, th this uh, session, this series, quote-unquote series of, of broadcasts that we have done and are doing now, is not over yet. Far, far, far from it. Yes, uh, not only that, but even this study that we've done and the, and the scriptural evidences that we've brought forward that showed people in black and white out of the New Testament, even this is just a, a once-over. Even this study is just a, a, a superficial evidentiary pre presentation. The listeners themselves can read the New Testament for themselves and find even more, com more convincing evidence that the New Testament, it's as if the New Testament was written for the very purpose of detailing the complete and perfect fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, bring in some new doctrine or anything, but anybody who reads the New Testament with Daniel's prophecy right there in their left hand while they read the New Testament, it's got to be stunned. The New Testament literally uses the very words out of Daniel's prophecy. And uh, for anybody to continue to say that there's a, a future 70th week of Daniel, would, is, is uh, what's the word I want to say? <laughs> for anybody to continue after reading the New Testament in that context as, as, a, as a written divine 
infallible evidentiary presentation of the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, and then to continue to believe in a future 70th week of Daniel is to spite one's own face. It's just, it's just insane. Now look, if Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, then there's got to be a diabolical purpose in saying that there's a future fulfillment of it. And that's what the Jesuits have prepared us all to do, to accept a counterfeit fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, thereby denying that Jesus was the Christ. And uh, that's the whole purpose of it. And... Uh, First of all, in order to have a future fulfillment of it, you have to have a phony antichrist to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to let them start building their temple and animal sacrifices again. When the Bible plainly says, and for purposes that we're talking about right now, that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, and not only that, but they are not, those sacrifices could never take away sin. The New Testament was literally written as though it was 2,000 years ago. It was uh, with the full understanding of this futurist deception that would eventually come and give us all arguments, give us all arguments to tear it down. I mean, how, how can you have hope in a temple built in a modern nation state of Israel when the Bible plainly says God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. And how can you hope and pray for the Jews to begin making animal sacrifices again in a future 70th week of Daniel in a future temple when God plainly said in plain English, these sacrifices could never take away sin. You see, I, I, I reiterate, I mean, I guess that's what I'm famous for, repeating myself over and over and over. But it's like you said before, the lies have been repeated so many times, you have to repeat the truth before anybody will listen. Yeah, there's, this, awful... there's the saying, oh, Tom, um, that the, uh, the lie has already gone all over the world in the meantime when the truth still is um, putting on its shoes, you know. Yeah, sure. A, a lie travels faster than the truth any day. And, and here's the deal. I mean, you tell, it's like, you know, even the Nazi regime said you tell a lie often enough that it becomes the truth. Well, why don't we tell the truth often enough that it becomes the truth? The truth is the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy is God's way of, 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 of communicating to his people. God prophesies and history reveals, okay? God prophesied through the prophet Daniel that there would be a seven-year period of time where the most holy would be anointed, where righteousness would be everlasting, where sin would be over with. And uh, you've got the prophecy right there for people to read it for themselves. Which one of those things was not fulfilled in that seven-year period that, that, was, that began with the baptism of Jesus and ended with the stoning of Stephen? What jot or what tittle of Daniel's prophecy was not perfectly and completely fulfilled and evidentiary uh, evidence given in the New Testament by two or three witnesses? Now, look, that's the test of the truth according to God's holy, eternal, and immutable law. By, every, by two or three witnesses, let everything be established. The New Testament is written in such a way that there are two, three, and even more witnesses of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70-week prophecy fulfilled. You can't read the New Testament with understanding 
and continue to believe that there's a future 70th week of Daniel. It's ludicrous. You know what boggles me the most, Tom, about the subject? When you read Daniel chapter 7, verses 24, uh, Daniel chapter 9, sorry, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, as I put them here on the screen for everybody to see in the AV 1611 King James Bible, yeah. I don't understand where they even get the hinge of understanding that there is a gap. It says in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks after in the first, in the first two yeah. verses, 24 and 25, we read that first there are seven weeks and then 62 weeks. So after the 69 weeks, which is this all together, after three score and two weeks, 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. There's nothing wrote about, and it, 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 there's going to be a gap of 2,000 years and anything else. No, it's uh, not. What, what I don't, way, listen, not, what, what, what I don't understand, Tom, what, what I don't understand, what I really have prob problem with understanding the people who follow the futurist teaching is, where do they get that gap from? It is not in here. There's not even a hinge, not even an idea of any word that you can use to put a gap there in between. That is my problem that I always had with misunderstanding. And I I'll think, and I think the, I, I think what we have to understand here and where we, where we should put our emphasis on is, you can only get that understanding of a 2,000 year gap between verse 25, the end of 25, and then starting 26, that uh, somewhere in the future, when you listen to man, when you listen to God, or when you read his Bible, it is clear as, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you use. In, in German, we say, das ist klar wie Klosbrühe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that means it is clear as listen, a, as a certain kind of soup that you that Let you me answer that. your question. You can't understand how they get this 2,000. What's the motive be, by, uh, for putting a 2,000-year gap? The answer is simple. No, not what is, the, what is the motive. I understand the motive because of their futurism. I understand that. But I don't see a hinge in the words, yet you can stretch the, the words written that there is a gap in there. That's what I don't see. That's what I didn't see in the beginning. That's, you know, when, when you and I met very first, you were so surprised that I understood the, the truth of Daniel chapter 9 from the very beginning. But that just because I read the Bible, I was not taught by preachers, by reverence, by pastors, by priests and the church. I listened to the word of God and I think the word of God, the Bible is so clear. There is no misunderstanding. That's my point that I want to make. Yeah, well, you, without being churched, and without being indoctrinated in futurism as I was for, you know, 50 years of my life, it was easy for you to read Daniel's prophecy and not even consider a 2,000-year gap. You had not been taught this nonsense. So you could read Daniel's prophecy just exactly the way it's written and make perfect sense out of it and see the historical fulfillment of it in the, in the seven years of Christ's ministry. So it was not difficult at all to convince you. It's only the people that have been to church that absolutely cannot comprehend this unless they've got divine help. They've been, they've been indoctrinated with futurism. They've been told there's a 2,000-year gap between the 69th and the 70th week. It's absolutely a lie, and it has a purpose. And that is to take the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy so that he can rule and reign over God's heritage for 2,000 years. The whole church age without resistance. After having placed the onus of Antichrist onto a single individual that doesn't even come on, uh, upon the world scene until just seven years before the end of time. The papacy is free to rule and reign over the kings of the earth and to kill the saints and the martyrs of Jesus and do all the things that the prophecy says of him without resistance. To shed the onus of Antichrist completely away from himself and onto a future figment of their diabolical imagination. And it's so silly, it's so childish, it's amazing. It's a marvel that anyone ever believed it. Well, so listen, here's another thing. You got Here's another thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's another thing you got to live with. 
<clears throat> if you're going to believe in a future fulfillment, that's like saying Daniel's prophecy or prophecy uh, continued to be fulfilled until about 70 A.D. or thereabouts. And then no more prophecy was fulfilled throughout the entire church age. You got to jump completely over the church age. 2,000 years. God went to sleep. Prophecy ended. And, and, and the world just had no spiritual direction. The church had no spiritual or, or, or prophetic significance for that whole 2,000 years. It's, it's the times of the Gentiles, and we'll just shut prophecy off, and we'll pick it up at the end of the church age <coughs> when the Jews are back in the land. I think, Tom, sorry to interrupt you here, but I think this is the thought that just came up when you said um, that the idea, of course, of futurism is to put the coming of Antichrist 2,000 years in the future while in the meantime yeah. he rules and nobody sees how he does it. Yeah, that's the point. When we when we read this quotation from superior general from the Jesuit superior general Michael Angelo Tamburini that he uh, made about 1720, that's something that you can find easily on the internet. As I just searched it out, he said the general of the Jesuits, and that is the society that is sworn to destroy the Bible, to destroy Protestantism, to destroy yep. the truth in the world, and they yep. are the army, the military of the Roman Catholic Church. He said to the Duke of, uh, Duke of Brancas, quote, See, my lord, from this room, from this room I govern not only Paris, but China. Not only China, but the whole world, without anyone knowing how it is managed. And that yeah. is exactly what you were putting in other words, that the Antichrist, because they, the Jesuits, are the minions of the Antichrist, rule the whole world without anyone knowing how it is managed. I think that yeah. is a very interesting quote to use and to explain to people where, f where futurism actually comes from. We don't see the real ruling power in the world. We don't want to see it because we listen to the preachers in our churches. But the yeah. preachers in our churches have at least since the beginning of the 19th century completely infiltrated by the Jesuits. Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, we figured out how the Jesuits have, have destroyed the Protestant church. You know, there may be some, a, a few more things that we haven't quite yet discovered, but uh, clearly it's evident now to me and to you and to some of the listeners, more and more people are coming to the realization that future, futurism single-handedly destroyed and emasculated the Protestant Reformation. That's why there's no protest anymore. That's why few people can even link the word Protestant with protest. They, they don't even know we're supposed to be protesting something, let alone protesting the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Protestantism got its name because it protested the man of sin in Rome. Protestantism is not Protestantism unless it protests the Antichrist. We're living in a whole world of Christianity that can't tell you who the Antichrist is. That's how perfectly and completely futurism has destroyed the Protestant Reformation. The evidence is in your face. No one can deny it. Not without looking absolutely ridiculous and trying. We're emasculated because we believed a lie. And I can give you an example from my own life. A few years ago, I spoke to the girlfriend of a friend of mine, uh, and she told me about her mother when I, when I asked, uh, oh, does, um, is, is, is she uh, a believer in God? She said, yeah, she's a protestant. I said, well, that's interesting that you said, well, I said, what is she protesting? She says, I don't Good know. Good question. Good I don't question. Know. <laughs> it ought to be asked by every protestant in this world. Yeah. What are you protesting? Not a one of them can tell you. And she said, I don't know. That's right. That's exactly right. That's the problem with all of us. 
we don't know what we're protesting. We're not protesting. That's the whole deal. We don't protest the Antichrist because we don't know who he is. He hasn't come on the world yet. He doesn't come until just before Christ returns. What a load of hooey! And there were hundreds of true Protestant writers who wrote books, libraries of books, denouncing futurism as the satanic and the Jesuit destruction of Protestantism. These are the books that we read and discuss. These are the books that we recommend that our listeners purchase and read and keep libraries of these Protestant books. The Protestant books that we recommend used to occupy the shelves of every Protestant church. You know, starting with Fox's Book of Martyrs, you couldn't hardly call yourself a Protestant if you had never read Fox's Book of Martyrs. But now, Protestant churches, if they have a library, you know what's on the shelves? The Left Behind series of videos. There's not one Protestant work on the shelves of the Protestant church libraries. Who's responsible for that? Who's in control of the libraries that used to exist in every Protestant church? Where are those books? The books by Henry Grattan Guinness, the books by James A. Wiley, <clears throat> and the likes of all the books that we read and discuss are on the programs, on your program and mine, Inquisition Update. This I picture spent I was a looking for. Sorry. I this, is, a... this is protest. That was a picture, sorry, I was looking for. This is protest on the streets in UK, and I think that's more than 10 years ago now. Put on the website even, protestthepope.org.uk. Protest the Pope. This is real protest. And where do you see that today? Huh? Where do you see that today? That's one of the most wonderful pictures I have on my computer in that regard. Yeah, and I'll bet if a person really investigated that, I don't mean to be a naysayer or try to gain save. You know, that, that banner that you see there, Protest the Pope, that is Protestantism. That is That's Protestantism, what Protestantism yeah. is. You protest the Antichrist, okay? Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. Okay, that that's Protestantism. If you don't if you don't abide by those rules, you can hardly call yourself a Christian, let alone a Protestant. But uh, you know, every every group's been infiltrated. Uh, look, Roman Catholicism is the papal church. Okay, Roman Catholicism is your next door neighbor that loves, worships, and obeys. The Antichrist, okay? The, the, the concern early in the Americas, in the, America, in, the, uh, in the United States was that every Roman Catholic is first and foremost a subject of the Pope. How can any Roman Catholic be a loyal American citizen if his true king and kingdom is Rome? His and first allegiance is to the Pope, yeah. How can, how can you trust a Roman Catholic to go side by side with a Protestant to war to defend this country when they're taking orders, not from the government of this country, but from Rome? That's what Protestantism is. You protest the Pope, you protest the Papal Church, and you show everybody no Roman Catholic can be trusted to be an American. If a Roman Catholic is a true American, he's running afoul of his papal God in Rome. Okay? The point is, Tom, these people take mental reservations when they speak any oath of allegiance oh. to the country they are serving, and they are 
giving a free card by the Pope of doing that to even use perjury. Right. Per, 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 perjury, perjury. Perjury is this? Per, perjury. Perjury, perjury. Perjury is the word. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Falsely swearing is what perjury is. Falsely yeah. swearing. The Pope even allows them to use perjury because it is for the better of the of the Church, and that is just at uh, my um, that is just um, the the motto of the Jesuits, uh, mm -hmm. which is that the end justifies the means. Right. All means are good to use if the end is good, and right. since the end is the total and authoritative uh, dictatorial rulership of the antichrist of this world all means to achieve that are good it's it's right. it's that easy and when you are a roman catholic you have one allegiance and your allegiance is to the pope and not to the nation you are serving and That's i right. think tom that that was made very uh, understandably clear when you read the first chapter of the book of rulers of evil of tapasosi where he mentions all the roman catholic congressmen and and, and senators and all that stuff um, when he when he showed how uh, every line of living in the United States of America, from banking through shipping through education through commerce, everything is controlled by a Roman Catholic, and this Roman Catholic pays his pays his allegiance only to the Pope, to the Roman Catholic right. Church. You cannot serve two masters, the Bible says, right? So That's you right. cannot serve the American president or the American people, for that matter, because actually those men are there to serve the people and not the president and the pope at the same time. You have to make a choice. And their choice is, of course, where they think their salvation is. And their salvation comes from the church. That means of itself that she is the only righteous church without there is no salvation for any man. That's the problem in the whole world. And people just go back to the ballots and, you know, uh, make a quote unquote choice, yeah, go to the elections and elect somebody who they think he is worthy to speak for them when they don't understand that the only person he speaks for is the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. <sighs> oh, sorry, this really gets me up. Especially when I think well, of the first chapter of Rulers of Evil, that that is yeah. so clear in that book. Yeah. Well, look, it's all the Protestant books. They all emphasized what is never talked about, much less admitted anymore. Yeah, take for example that, James Edkin Wiley's Roman Civil Liberty, right? Yeah. Or exactly. or, or, or John Dowling's uh, the book that you read in more than 150 broadcasts uh, yeah. as your last work on First Amendment Radio in the time about the history of Romanism. Right. For 10 years, Trump's day so after day after day, I read Protestant works to inform and alert the American people to the hazard uh, of uh, Roman Catholicism and the Antichrist Church. And I read those Protestant books. And uh, it's just it's uh, it's just amazing to me that more people haven't uh, embraced the truth. Futurism is a lie. Futurism paints a glorious picture that Protestants will never be persecuted. They'll never see tribulation. They'll be raptured out before the whole world goes to hell. And that's a pipe dream uh, built right out of the pits of hell. It's a lie, and it has, and nobody wants to believe the truth. The lie is so much uh, prettier. The lie tastes so much better. The lie is good news. Who wants to believe the bad news? And you know something? That's the problem that every prophet of God faced in his generation. Nobody wants to believe the bitter truth. So they believe a flowery lie. Well, a flowery lie is only a complement to what futurism really is. Futurism is the most diabolical, the most powerful, the most effectual deception ever since the Garden of Eden. And it has taken all of Protestant Christianity and just sucked it right down the drain. Now the Roman Catholics have a free reign in this country. Protestants are just as apt to go to the polls and vote for a, for a Catholic as anybody.
Why? Well, because they've got all the connections. They're the they're the people who can get things done. The Roman Catholics got are you know they got politics down pat. I mean, after all, they've been doing it for two thousand years. You always want to put a Catholic in high in high places of authority in this country. Because if you put a Bible believing Protestant in there, he won't get anything done. The Catholics will vote him out every time. So that's the way it is in this country. That's the way it is in this country. There's no Protestantism in the White House. There's no Protestantism in the in the in the in the Congress. There's no Protestantism, not one single Protestant on the Supreme Court, and hasn't been for decades. I can't even name you the last Protestant that was on the Supreme Court. It's as almost as if it's illegal for a Protestant to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, the first the needs same... to be found the Protestant, Tom, who is a who is worth of the name Protestant in the United States of America in that well, you kind could, of if, uh, function. You, you could you couldn't find a true Protestant in this this country if you had X-ray vision. Yeah. you know there's a saying. Um, I don't know if you see uh, how how to say that in English. I just try to uh, to translate that. But people rather choose to be caressed to death with a lie instead of being slapped with the truth for once. Yeah. yeah. yeah this is why they all the prophets of God they they killed. Some even sawn in two with saws. Uh, a prophet's a bad uh, uh, you know a bad omen. The prophet Daniel prophesied all these things. And if he were alive today, the futurists would slay him. It's just unbelievable the lies that people love and worship and obey. Look, we're, this country is overrun with papists. In every country in the world where the Roman Catholic Church is, is in existence and, in, and is flour, flourishing, Protestantism is destroyed. That's in about 179 countries who have a concordat with the Vatican. Yeah. Every country where the Roman Catholic Church is allowed to exist and prosper soon controls the government. Okay? That's, that's just a given. Every country in the world where the Roman Catholic Church is allowed to exist and to prosper soon becomes a Roman Catholic nation. And history is full of examples. Oh, full of examples. That's why we read these books to prove to people. Especially the book from Griesinger, for example, yeah? Yeah, yeah. about the Jesuit order from the beginning up to 1866 when he wrote that book, uh, a two-volume book of 800 pages that you can get in English. He's, he speaks of so many countries, the infiltration of the Jesuits in India, Japan, Indochina, China, uh, South America, Paraguay, most of all, the Paraguayan reductions. He speaks of uh, the infiltration in Spain, Portugal, Italy, Germany, France. Um, it's, it's just incredible when you have that book, what history you learn about how the uh, missionaries of the Jesuits uh, came all over in the, in, in the world. And, and, the, and the point is, that is how they, uh, how they started, for example, in Japan. Um, Japan was a closed country, you know, and it hasn't really been discovered for, uh, by, other, by other nations. It has closed itself down, but they opened themselves up for trade. And first came the trade ships, and right after the trade ships came the missionaries. And they always come together. And people, of course, welcome the trade ships because with trade you get money. And why does the Bible say the love of money is the root of all evil? Yeah. Because with the money, with the trade, come the missionaries of the Roman Catholic Church. And they then start preaching and teaching the idolatrous, superstitious, Roman Catholic, sun-worshipping, Baal-worshipping pagan religion mm -hmm. that is hidden under a veil of quote-unquote Christianity. Let me re relate this to a a, 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 a current uh, situation 
there's uh, both Democrats and Republicans accusing one another of allowing the 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 the, uh, the Russians to control the outcome of our elections. Russian uh, interference into our electoral process. I mean, it ought to uh, excite concern from every American to discover that any foreign potentate had any influence on our electoral process. Okay, that's a legitimate concern. But never, but no one ever stops to realize that in every country that allows Roman Catholicism free reign to prosper, to practice and to prosper, every Roman Catholic in that country is first and foremost subservient to a foreign potentate called the Pope. Okay, every Roman Catholic in every country where Roman Catholicism is, a, is free to practice and to prosper becomes a fifth column. Now you can look that up on Wikipedia if you don't know what fifth column is. Fifth column is uh, people that flood into a, a country and become part of a society that is eventually to be destroyed by a foreign enemy. The enemy sends immigrants into the country that they are eventually going to conquer, and they get control of the of the, the the political process. They get control of the military. They they study the infrastructure of the country. They they assess its weak points. They assess its strengths, and they they inform the invading country how to proceed with the invasion to take the best opportunity to overthrow that government. That's a fifth column, okay? If country A wants to take over country B, so they immigrate a whole bunch of domestic-type workers that work in the, the steam shops, that work in the electrical power plants, work on the railroads. They learn how to do the banking, they, they might serve in government. They might preach in a church. They infiltrate the country. They, they live, eat, breathe in the country that they're going to take over and prepare for the destruction of the country. I so think, when, yeah, sorry, that, sorry, Tom. I think to, to speak a little bit more and picturesque for the people, uh, it is easy to say the fifth column is the modern Trojan horse. That's right, the modern Trojan horse. Okay. Every country that allows Roman Catholicism to, to, to practice and to prosper has embraced the Roman fifth column. That's, the, that's made them a part of their society, an equal part of their society. What would the American people say if the, they, they were, if, if I or somebody else was to tell them, that within this country are seek, are millions of people secretly loyal to Vladimir Putin of the Soviet Union of Russia. Why the people would come out of their skin? What if you were to tell that 25% uh, uh, of the adult uh, uh, working class people of this country were loyal to the imam of, Muslim, of Islam? They were secret Islamists. And they were preparing this country for an Islamic invasion. The people would be in, they would be insane with fear. Okay? But nobody ever stopped to think that 25% of the population of this country are loyal to the Pope. See, that doesn't make that doesn't mean anything to the people. That doesn't that doesn't strike fear and terror. Well, I guarantee you, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, it struck fear and terror. When they realized that they had been serving the man of sin, the son of perdition, 
the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of Rome, the popes of Rome, they'd served him, they'd worshipped him and obeyed him, even their own governments were papal governments, and they were actually making war with the Lamb of God in doing so. The understanding that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist led to the population of the quote-unquote New World, the United States of yeah. America, in the first place. So yeah. some people who call themselves patriots should just go back to the roots of the founding of their country and understand why people came over there in the very first place, Tom. Yeah. You know what I say to every Roman Catholic? You're no different than a Russian. You're no different than a Muslim. You're no different. You've got loyalties to the Pope. You're not an American. You can't serve in our government. You're going to do what the Pope tells you to do. Not only can he bind you to civil law, but he can bind you to spiritual law, too. He can close the churches and prevent you from going to heaven. He can lock up heaven and he can open hell for you. Of what you believe. So is who, who, who are they going to obey? Right. Who are they going to obey? They're going to obey the Pope. And, because uh, they believe a false gospel. Because the Pope doesn't have the keys to heaven. The Pope doesn't have the keys to hell. That's right. The Pope doesn't have any more power than Tom for us. None. Well spoken. You got no power. And if Tom Fress has any power, any power whatsoever, it's that he believes and preaches the truth that is found only in the Bible and only in Christ. And if I don't have that, I don't have any power at all. The only thing the people have correct when they say that Putin mingles in with the elections of America is the beginning letter of his name, P. Instead of Putin, just use Pope. Yeah, and yeah. you're correct. But that's what they, they want all believe. serve the papacy. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, this, this was common knowledge at the time of the Protestant Reformation. It was common knowledge that all of the kings of the earth serve the man of sin in Rome. It is written, Tom. It's written. That's Re right. Are we going to believe the historians or are we going to believe Jesus? Oh, the Pope doesn't have that much power, Tom. He's just a doddering old fool over in Rome. It's a, what? Well, Rome is what? 108 acres? And they got no money. They're always panhandling. They don't have any money. They don't have a military. They don't have any power. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Nobody can comprehend the power of the papacy. But yeah, the Protestant just... Reformation, the Protestant reformers knew how much power he had. He was as if it were God on earth. He dictated everything that happened in the in in the Middle Ages. The noonday for the papacy was the midnight of the world. And the history books were dripping with all the blood of the martyrs that the papacy ordered slaughtered and tortured and burned because they wouldn't bend the knee and worship him. And I'm telling you, they call that the old world order. Let me tell you, there's not one nickel's difference between the old world order and the new. Now, the only difference is the people are new to that order. <laughs> but that's the, it. People are, the, the people are just, uh, what, what's the word? Blind and deaf and dumb dogs. Uh, by being unfamiliar with they history, are. they don't see the repetition of it. No. Blind, deaf, and dumb dogs. There's no threat against the papacy anymore. The Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy has a clean slate. He can do whatever he wants. He's got control of the militaries of the world. 
He's got an influence at the United Nations. He's got an influence in Congress in the United States. He's got an influence in every government in this world. We've returned to the dark days of the Middle Ages. And how could it be possible? How could it be possible that only 503 years ago, the Protestant reformers completely overturned the political and religious structure of Europe? All of Europe, even the very loyal Roman Catholic countries like Spain and Portugal, They kicked out the Jesuits. They were sick and tired of Jesuit meddling in politics and religion. They weren't so loyal Catholic after the Protestant Reformation. <coughs> what has happened to it? What has happened to Protestantism in this world? I'll tell you, it's one word, futurism. And we've been talking about it and repeating ourselves over and over and over, hoping people finally comprehend it, and at least think enough of it to begin doing their own research about it. Research the Counter-Reformation. I mean, certainly we can remember the word Counter-Reformation. It's that which opposes the Protestant Reformation. It's the Counter-Reformation. It's led by the Jesuit order. It was begun at the Council of Trent in 1545. And Protestant writers all over the world wrote about it. Their writings and their books are still available to be read. The truth is almost in your hand. All you got to do now with the Internet and with the computer is to just Google the title of the book and read all the Protestant books. Those libraries that have long since disappeared out of our Protestant churches, now they're free to be read online. Many of them. And others are being reprinted and, 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 and printed so that we can buy them and have a hard copy of them in our house and read them to our children and our grandchildren. But look, if you like chocolate frosting and chocolate cake, uh, uh, on the futurist, you're, you're not going to listen to the bitterness of the truth. If your heart is set on a rapture, you're not going to buy those books. You're not going to read those books. You're going to continue to believe a lie. And listen, ignorance is not bliss. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. Ignorance is not bliss. No, ignorance is the road to damnation, Tom. That's right. It's it's pathetic what has happened. Look, I mean, if if you can if you can comprehend what we've been talking about here on this program for the last months, however long we've been at it, you've got to comprehend that your churches are absolutely no help. The churches are where we're, the lies come from. They all preach futurism. They all teach futurism. They don't even consider historicism. And uh, they're headlong down the road to perdition. Who are those who believe, who make and believe lies? for their own destruction. I don't, you know, I say I want to restore Protestantism. Protestantism was only a halfway measure. Okay? In a lot of ways, it failed, even right out of the gate. We need to return to true biblical Christianity. We need to know just as much as we know that Jesus is the Christ, we need to know that the papacy is the Antichrist. 
and pray against him. And act and accordingly, and, Tom. And act accordingly, yes. And you just got to give up. You got to quit believing lies. Quit believing futurist lies. Our God is a God of mercy. He'll forgive us our sins, but we got to confess our sin. And that means we have to confess futurism. It's a sin. It's a departure from the truth. It's a fabrication of the man of sin in Rome. It's a fabrication of the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Look, if you are sick and tired of losing your liberties in the United States of America, where did all your liberties go? You know now. You know who's taking away your liberties and making you a slave. Christ came to make you free and free indeed. Rome wants to enslave you and he's always had the free use of every government. And that's who's enslaving you. And the purpose of that enslavement is to make sure that you worship a false Christian, a false Christ, the papacy. And, uh, this is what the Protestant writers warned the world about in everything they wrote. In everything that they wrote, there came with it an inherent warning about the man of sin in Rome and how he controlled the, the lives and convicted the spirits of every man, woman, and child in the Dark Ages. I mean, if you worship God and God alone in the Dark Ages, you were found in direct violation of Roman Catholic canon law. If you worship God in spirit and in truth during the Dark Ages, you were the subject of an inquisitorial search for heretics, okay? You were a heretic. If you believed the Bible and the Bible alone, you were a heretic. And in that, in that day and age, it was no sin to kill a heretic. More than that, it was a meritorious work. Now, it sounds to many people like I'm just making this up. It's easily verified in any Protestant writing you can get your hands on. that it was not only legal but meritorious to kill a Bible-believing Christian is codified in the, in the Third and Fourth Lateran Councils, ecumenical councils of the Roman Catholic Church. It's codified in Roman Catholic canon law. In Directorium Inquisitorum, Tom. That is a That's writing right. that was put out where it is actually stated that it is a meritorious work to kill a heretic. Yeah. Directorium Inquisitorum. Look it up on the internet. Do your own research on that. Yeah. It's not only in Protestant writings, Tom, because that is a very important point. It is also in Roman Catholic writings. Yeah. That is what people have to understand. Of course, you can easily say, well, well, that's all in Protestant writings. Of course, they are against the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they write things like this. It is to be found in the Directorium Inquisitorum, and that is from the Roman Catholic Church itself. It is found in the Annals of the Council of Trent, where yeah. the dogmas of the Council of Trent are written down. It was codified in Roman Catholic canon law at the Council of Trent. It was fortified at the Council of Trent. It was reiterated at the Council of Trent. 
everything that went before, all the dogmas and all the uh, anathemas of, of Bible-believing Christianity was reiterated at the Council of Trent. They had the authority of not only the popes, but the councils as well. And uh, uh, look, I, you know, people tell me, well, Tom, my neighbors are Roman Catholic, and they're nice people. We go on vacation together with them. Uh, we go over for Sunday dinner with them. And uh, we 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 uh, go shopping together. We get along just fine. There's wonderful people. They're good Christian people. W what you say doesn't make sense, Tom. We live in peace with our Roman Catholic neighbors. They're they're good Christians. Are they really? Well, do you know that we're in a time of armistice with the Roman Catholic Church because, for the most part. The protest is over. Why? Because nobody in the Protestant, uh, nobody in the Protestant churches protests the Pope anymore. I mean, we've befriended the Roman Catholics. They don't have to worry about what we say anymore. It doesn't matter what history says. It doesn't matter what the Scripture says. So they're no threat. So why not be friends? Perhaps we can make them. Catholic, like we are. And that's exactly what's happening. There's this all this apparent peace and religious kumbaya taking place. Why? Because there's no more protest. Protestants have laid down thrown down their, their arm, thrown down their weapon. You know, they've thrown down the, the sword of the spirit. They buried it in the dirt. They're no threat anymore. And perhaps if we can just be nice for a while, maybe they'll just convert to Roman Catholicism. But you pick up the sword, the Protestant sword, that is the Word of God. Then there's no more fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. All of a sudden, the distinction between the holy and the profane comes very apparent. You realize that Roman Catholics worship a man, not God. Roman Catholics obey Roman Catholic canon law and not God's, uh, you know, uh, moral law. And uh, they worship Mary, images and idols. And saints. And dead saints. They're necromancers. They're sorcerers. And they're damned. There's no salvation in the Roman Catholic Church because they crucify Christ every day. As if his one-time all-sufficient sacrifice for sin 2,000 years ago was worthless. The priest has to redo it every day. They have to make Jesus a victim every single day. All of a sudden those Protestant books start to make a lot of sense. But uh, you got to be willing to believe the truth and to give up all the lies. Spit out that futurist uh, cake and that luscious rapture frosting. Spit it out of your mouth. And all of a sudden you realize at any time at the decree of the Pope, every Roman Catholic becomes a fifth column to overturn this country and to kill all opposition within it. And it has happened over and over 
and over and over again in history. Everywhere that Roman Catholicism was allowed to practice and to prosper eventually became a bloodbath for non-Roman Catholics. Every government was overthrown and made to be Roman Catholic. And that you don't know about this history is your Protestant pastor's fault. You know, everybody's worrying about the Russians. Everybody's worrying about the Islamists. Everybody's worrying about the Mexicans coming across the border. You've got everything to worry about. Coronavirus, you've got uh, imminent financial collapse. But you don't think anything about the papacy or the Roman Catholics, 25% of the population. 25% of the population are Roman Catholic fifth columnists. At least. You don't you don't have to worry about the Knights of Columbus whose openly spoken motto is make America Catholic. Well that doesn't mean anything to you because you're a Protestant. You're dead. You laid down your sword. Just unbelievable what has happened in this country. You know, at the founding of this country, there were 13 colonies. Twelve of them were strictly Protestant. No Catholicism was allowed to either practice or prosper. Roman Catholicism was outlawed. And if a Roman Catholic priest was caught serving the Mass to Roman Catholics in hiding... They were convicted of a crime. Okay? It was a criminal thing to be a Roman Catholic in 12 of the 13 colonies. And the one colony that was Roman Catholic was Maryland. Okay? It's not Maryland. It's Maryland. And even there, Roman Catholicism was not allowed to be practiced. Openly. No Roman Catholic could serve in any government, state, county, local. No Roman Catholics allowed to serve in a seat of power. No Roman Catholic services. No Roman Catholic priests. Roman Catholics had to worship their God in Rome underground. And even the leading Jesuits in this country had to send warning to the Pope of Rome, keep your hands off of us here in the United States. These people here in the United States or the, the, the early American colonies were in no mood for outside interference from a foreign potentate, and especially not the Pope. Every Roman Catholic was put on notice. You keep your laws and your traditions out of this country. And it was against the law to practice Christmas. This country was supermajority Protestant. Roman Catholicism was outlawed. And look where we are today. And you mean to tell me the Pope has no power? That Roman Catholicism are uh, Roman Catholics are just good Christians like the rest of us? Um, I say get out of your church. Go find a good Protestant book. Refresh your history. And find out the truth. And realize that the only reason the United States isn't as staunchly Protestant as it was during the, the, the uh, colonial period is because of futurism. 
the teaching that the Antichrist is not the Pope, it's not the papacy, and every Pope in succession from the first to the last, no, it's a single individual that comes right at the end of time, just seven and a half or seven or three and a half years before Christ returns. And the Antichrist is skips over the entire Christian era. Not a factor. And that before Antichrist comes, we'll all be raptured out of the way. Which makes more sense to you? I'll tell you what makes more sense to me. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. History makes that inarguably true. And he has persecuted the saints all throughout the Christian era. He has been the enemy of Christ, the enemy of the truth, the enemy of God's people for the entire Christian era. The Protestants, the Protestant reformers were Roman Catholics who finally got, the cop, got a copy of the scriptures in their own language so they could read it for themselves instead of being spoon-fed spoon fed from a Latin-speaking priest. They read it for themselves, and they came to the unanimous conclusion. There was no argument among them. They came to the unanimous conclusion that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, and they came out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest. And I'm here to tell you, while the papacy and the Jesuits think the protest is over, I'm here to tell you, in my life at least, it ain't over. And it'll never be over. Because just as much as I know that Jesus is the Christ, I likewise know that the papacy is the man of sin, the Antichrist. And I know, because I believe the Bible, he reigns over the kings of the earth. And they don't serve us. They serve the papacy. And their intent is to make us all Roman Catholic. Without our knowledge, without our consent, without, be, without our will, and against Christ, to make us enemies of Christ. That's what their intent is. And they've already proven it. Anybody who reads the New Testament can see for themselves. The very words that are written in the New Testament confirm beyond any argument that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Every jot and every tittle. And that if you believe in a future fulfillment, you have been deceived and you must repent. That